This morning, what I want to do is I just want to talk to you. I want to give you a message. If you're looking for a title, it's called Jesus the Hero, Not the Celebrity. And um, we live in a time where it's, it's more, you, there's more fame to be a celebrity rather than a hero. It's amazing that we have celebrities giving us, telling us how we should live, what we should do, how we should uh, raise our kids and things like that. But when you look at their lives, that's a whole nother story. And I, I believe that media has given us celebrities, but I, I know that danger and risk give us heroes. You know, I read a story this morning about a, a policeman. They had some things going on. He ran into uh, just a lot of confusion and was willing to risk his own life. To me, that's a hero. I have my third son. He's a, he's a paramedic fireman. He's uh, in Nashville, and he's one of the top. He's in, there's only 30 guys like him. They, he's kind of like a special forces fireman kind of guy. He's my hero. And, you know, when you have a baby that you have to resuscitate and it doesn't come back and you're holding it and the mother is like, please, please. There's been people that he's helped and his stories and some things. He goes, Dad, I just can't talk about these things right now. I, I, I think about uh, policemen are heroes. Firemen are heroes. Our, our military are heroes. And you know what? There are preachers and there's ministers all across the world that are some of my greatest heroes. And, you know, because the gap is much wider between fame and greatness. It just is. And heroism is about honor and bravery, and celebrity is just about image. And um, we have big names today, but we don't have big persons. And what I want to do, what, what's scary, some, some see celebrities and not heroes rise even in the church. Are you hearing me? J.J. and Esther aren't celebrities. They love God passionately. That's why they're here. I just want you to know that. Do you believe that? And, and so, you know what? Well, we, we, it's scary that, we, they, that we're like that. And we, we have to be careful today. Pastors aren't the sinner, but Jesus is. Does that make sense to you? And, and, and see, I, I just, you know, for me, is we, have, we have to make sure the stars aren't outshining the sun. And, you know, you can't come across as clever and, and have Jesus come across as wonderful at the same time. And, and this morning, there's sobering words, you know. But he, here's the thing. If you look with me, the Apostle Paul shows us who the hero of the greatest story ever told is. And I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. If you have a Bible or your phone, most people have their phones now and stuff. And, 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 and it, it just says this. I'm going to go ahead and read. He said, God exalted him, multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names. What kind of name? The greatest. Okay, not just the name, regular, the greatest of all names. The authority, that means rulership. That means authority to have anything. It's the authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow and reverence in everything. Listen to what it says. Everything and everyone will one day submit to his name. If you don't submit to him now, one day you will, you will, you will just, you, no one's going to force you, but you're going to find out his authority. You're going to see his love. You're going to see compassion, but you're also going to see a moment where, golly, some people are going to go, some people are going to go, I regret how I lived. And then look what it says. It says, in this, in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and in the demonic realm, every and every tongue will proclaim in every language, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh, bringing glory and honor to God, his Father. Paul not only wants us to remember this, but he also wants to see what the Father thinks about his Son. You know, Paul tells us God put Jesus on the pedestal, and we must remember it's all about the Son, Jesus. You know, there was a, you know, I, uh, Augustus said this, Christ is not valued at all if he isn't valued above all. He needs to be valued above all that we, who we are, what we believe, what we trust in. You know, there's a story of a wealthy man that, who had a son whom he really loved. Him and his son loved fine art. 
Because he was wealthy, the father, he and his son worked in a mass, a, a phenomenal collection, a priceless collection of artwork, works of art. And he was, when he was old enough, the son joined the Marines because he just, he, he felt like he wanted to, it was in the Vietnam era, he wanted to join the Marines and, and, and he, he was killed in action. His father's heart was broken. Several years later, the wealthy man died and the works of art were to be auctioned off. There, there, there was millions of dollars worth of, of art waiting to be bid on. Van Gogh's, Moliers. And, the law, and what happened, the family lawyer came up and he announced to the crowd as they came for this auction. And, and he, he, what he did, is he, he said, you know what? The lawyer now said, he said, all these millionaires sitting there and everything. And people, want to, uh, uh, people had money from other families that wanted certain pieces of art. And the lawyer announced that the crowd, that before, before any of the value pieces of art were auctioned off, the father had left specific instructions that the portrait of his son had to be auctioned off first. And so what happens is, the impatient art dealers, they pull up the, the son's portrait, and they're like, oh, come on. Come on, let's get on with the auction. Let's get to the real art. And what happened is, to get the picture out of the way, so they begin to bid. Who will give me $100 for this portrait? And no one bid. Then he got down to 20 Who will give me $20 for this portrait of the son? And one of his old... Military buddy says, I'll give you 20. And auctioner goes, $20 going once, $20 going twice, sold for $20. And as soon as that happened, at that moment, the rich man's attorney stepped into the front and announced to the crowd, ladies and gentlemen, there will be no more bidding. He said, my client left specific instructions that whoever bought the painting of a son would receive all the other works of art without additional fees. Whoever chooses my son gets it all. This concludes the auction. Let me just say, whoever chooses Jesus gets it all. Are you with me? You see, don't get it mixed up. It's not the church you go to. It, it's who your pastor is. Did you choose the son? Jesus is the name. That's the name who gets it all. That's the name that gets you and me in heaven. Amen? Amen. I, can you imagine when we're standing before heaven and the semi-trucks of files come from the enemy and go, hey, on such and such a day, Bubba McCann did this, 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 and then all of a sudden, I'm guilty. But I love it. My defense attorney, Jesus, is going to come. He said, well, hey, washed in the blood. No longer to be seen. No longer to be a part of. Enter into your rest. You see, there's three things. You need to keep Jesus. If you're going to keep him the hero of your life, I want to talk about. The first one is you have to have the right perspective. Perspective is not what I see, but how I see it. Sometimes the facts are what we're looking at. Your filter is what you're looking through. Am I making sense here? Come on, church. Are y'all just quiet? You know? I'm used to going, come on, pastor, preach, do something, come on. Anyway, I'm trying to help you. You see, the fact, see, we spend a lot of time trying to get God to see things through our perspective when all along God's trying to help us to see things through his perspective, how he sees things, how he sees people, how he sees situations. Over two years, it'll be two years, yeah, it's two years, that I was in ICU, some of you know the story, and I had a pulmonologist that came and said, told my wife several times, hey, this is how long he has, I don't think he's going to make it, Get him. You need, to, you need to prepare that if he does come out of this, he'll never be the same. We need to put him, you need to be prepared to put him in a nursing home if he makes it. And he'd come in every day, and he'd say, well, the number is this, and it wouldn't change, and he said, it's not getting any better, and it's not getting any worse. Then about the third or fourth day, my wife said, Dr. Cormier, I don't want to hear about the numbers anymore. I just want to know one thing. 
will you pray and believe with me for my husband to come out of this? After the sixth day, well, the fifth day, they tried to take the tubes out of me. I could show you pictures. I, I should have brought it so you could see, see the reality of it. My wife would read scripture over me. She'd have other people pray over me, and she'd put it on speaker on the phone and, and just pray over me. Let, let me just say, I had people all over the world praying for me. That's the gospel truth. In that sixth day, they finally were able to take the tubes out. And uh, her and my son Zach were there. And um, I came too. And she said, the first thing you said is let's get out of this popsicle stand. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but I wasn't right in my mind a little bit. I, I'd been on Michael Jackson fentanyl medication. I'd been, you know, I was ready to you know, do dances and stuff. I don't know about that, but. But I had different moments. I've had different challenges. I had a lady come to me while we we're doing chemo about two or three months ago, and she said, is this your first time? And I go, no, ma'am, it's not. I said, I could write a novel. <laughs> you know, I've had over, over 100 chemo in my port. I had four and a half years of oral chemo for multiple myeloma, but they can't find it anymore. You know, the multiple myeloma. You know, and I've had doctors, you know, I told her, I said, no, ma'am. She started, she goes, yeah, but I have, she started telling me what kind of cancer she had, kind of what I, like colon cancer and stuff. And I, and she goes, and the doctor said, I only have so. And I said, stop. Don't you ever let a doctor put an expiration date on you. Only God has that for you and me and for anybody in this room. And you know, in January, many of you have been praying for me. I had to go back to the doctor because I was coughing when I'd go hunt and put my decoys out and just when I exert myself and uh, I try to walk at least three and a half miles a day, sometimes more, sometimes, but and what happened is I went to the doctor and they did a CT scan on me. And I want to show you the CT scan. On the right, right here, you can see the, on, the, on the far right, that's my left lung. That's a CT scan. On the left of that is my right lung. And you see that gray matter? You see how a, a lung should be clear like on the left side? All that gray matter is my, can my tumor in my lung. And then if you can see the center part, my air passage is almost blocked. That's in January, and this is in April. There's still some tumor there. There's still some things, but it's God. It's only Jesus. And my doctor called me. She was so excited. And I go, what's well, Jesus? It's the prayers of the saints. And every time I go in there, you know, my son Andrew brought me one time and the lady goes, you know what? We know why your daddy's still alive. Because we scratch our heads and go, how is he alive? He should be dead. And she goes, we know why. Because he comes in here, he prays for people, he talks to people, he, he just brings hope. I remember a lady, one time I was preaching in a church and I go, I used to be on dope. And she goes, and I, and I go, but and she came up after the service. She goes, Bubba, you used to be on dope, baby, but now you give hope in the head of every person there so we can cope. So you went from dope to hope so we can cope. Amen. God, how I many know God can turn anything around? You see, Philippians says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't like that verse, some people would say. How can I rejoice in my circumstance? It's your perspective. My dad used to tell me, son, when someone gives you a lemon, make lemonade. When you go through a situation or circumstance, he's the same God that rescued you, saved you from your sin, saved you from yourself, saved you from your lifestyle that everybody said you would never change in. 
And that's where people look at you. Go, look what God has done. Kind of like the old song. We used to sing that. Look what God has done. Anyway, no matter. Catherine's up here, but Catherine, we don't want to go. You don't want me to leave. <laughs> where we make the mistake is we often try to view God through our circumstances. If it's bad, God must be mad at us. Hello, am I in the right crowd? You see, I want you to view your circumstances through the goodness of God. If you look for Jesus, let me just say this, you will find him. He said, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. It's whether we're willing to... There's a difference. I preached to the men last, last week in Jennings. We did have a men's Bible study, a men's breakfast, and they asked me to come and talk. And I said, guys, I'm going to talk to you about today is the Jenny Craig gospel. <laughs> what do you mean? Jenny Craig gospel says you need to have self-denial. You need to stay away from that bad donut. I mean, come on. How many of you know that... Something can taste good going in, but it leaves lots of shrapnel behind. It's called the gut bomb. And they want you to get rid of the gut bombs in your life and buy their food. And if you buy their food, then it costs a small fortune. I've never done it, but it's a lot. And you too, you know, they can go, you can look like that, or you can look like this. You know what I mean? That, you too, after Jenny Craig, it's, it's. Denying self. But see, the gospel's different. The Bible says that we're to die, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. There's a difference. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about me dying, about you dying. Thank you, Pastor Bob, but what an encouraging message. <laughs> Truth sets you free. If I die to myself, I remember when Rick and I met in a coffee shop, if it's okay to say, and he just, he began to see, he began to realize there was things that he needed to die to that had him. And at that moment, God came and met him in a coffee shop as I prayed for him. And I can look around, there's different people in this crowd. God's done incredible things in your life. And you don't see through the same lens anymore. You begin to again go, Jesus, I'm seeing. I believe that I, my prayer for every one of you, God give you Jesus contact lenses. So you start seeing through his perspective and you have hope for everyone around you. You see, some of you are one revelation away from a breakthrough. I was... I know I went through one of my sessions of chemotherapy and I got finished and it was, they declared me cancer free and I, I got to go ring the bell. And I had my friend Ronnie Lyles with me from, and Ronnie drove me there and he goes, Pastor Bubba, he was, we went and ate shrimp the other night and he goes, I wish I would have had a video for that day. He, he, he always thought, that day that you rang the bell, I said, I rang the hell out of that bell. <laughs> Sorry. There's other interpretations of King James I'm not going to go to that I can tell you about. But anyway. And then when I did that, I remember after I rang it, I just, before I rang it, I just, I, there was, there, I was in the waiting room. I said, hey, look, I just want to tell you something. I'm able to ring this bell because of what Jesus has done and carry me through everything. And I'm preaching to him. Okay, just like I'm talking to you right now. And then I'm going to ring this bell. But I'm ringing this bell to celebrate Jesus and what he's done in my life and how he spared me. And I just. <laughs> and there was a lady sitting in there and she started weeping loud. And I thought, oh, my gosh, she, she has cancer. And so I went over there. I'm so sorry, ma'am. Are you okay? What kind of cancer? She goes, I don't have cancer. You've given me hope for my husband. He's in treatment right now. I'm just sitting here waiting. But you're giving me hope. I believe this. When we begin to see Jesus through the contact lenses that he gives us, we see church different. We see people different. Are you hearing me? The second thing I want you to see is not only do you need perspective, but some of you just need purpose in your life. You don't feel like you have any purpose. 
I'm not picking on Rick, but we talked this a little bit this morning. I, I said, I think I have a message for you. It has to do a little bit with purpose because we talked about some things. Because, you know, when you get older, see, when you're young, you're right and tight. When you get older, you sag and drag. <laughs> you know, that's just the way, you know, there's just things that you used to not have to bother with. You know, there's just things that jump on your body. Uh, anybody can say amen on any of that? Anyway, just, okay, so you young people, you don't even know yet. But I, re- I hear people often say things like this. I just don't see the purpose. Have you ever heard that before? I don't see the reason why. What's the point? Why should I keep trying? You ever hear of that? That ever come out of your mouth? How many of you hate pain? Raise your hand. Come on. How many of you hate pain? How many of you love pain? If you raise your hand, we're going to pray for you right now, Lord Jesus. Help them. Say Damascus is spirit, you know. I'm going to argue with you that that's not completely accurate. People don't hate pain. What they hate is pain without a purpose. People can endure pain if, they're, if they have a purpose. Let me give you a couple again. How about, some, you, how many of you know you are willing to go through pain if you know there's a big paycheck on the other end? Come on. You'll endure sun, you'll endure elements, you'll endure... People that you don't want to work with, that you don't even like, and they don't like you. Come on. But you'll walk through the pain if there's a big check saying, if you can endure this for 15 days, we're going to quadruple your paycheck. Come on, baby. I'm coming. So men are going, new bass boat. Women are going, come on, baby. Shopping. Shopping till we drop. Some people endure pain running a marathon. 26 miles. I, th- I think about those iron men and iron women competitions. 26 miles, three miles swimming. Come on. 100 mile bike ride. And then I think it's three miles running after all of that. Come on. I'm like, to me, I'm going, what's the point? <laughs> They're willing to go through the pain. People do CrossFit. They want to go through the pain because they have a picture of what they want to look like. And I think you should. All of us should exercise. All of us should do things, you know, to kind of help yourself. I do. I walk. I do light exercises. I do push-ups. I try to do what I can with what I got. Come on. But it's, it's some of us sagging. <laughs> you see, how about women with childbirth? But there ain't no pain like a woman in childbirth. And all the women said, amen. y'all must have something different in the water here in Crowley. Because when I've been to other churches, they go, amen. My wife and I have six children. We have five boys and one girl. I've been with her to all her pregnancies. I've been there. I've had hamburger breath because she told me she didn't like my breath. You know, they're just, women are sensitive about things. And, and, and I remember she, and, I remember she only had one epidural for one of my children, and that's it. All the others she did drug free. My mom was with her on one of the birth, on several of the births, and she just one of the births. I think it was my son Nathan. She goes, "You are just a real woman." <laughs> my grandmother said, when, "In the '40s, she goes, I didn't know what I had for three or four days. They drugged me so much." People don't hate pain. What they hate is pain without a purpose. Don't just, don't just look at, at life from a perspective of pain. Just see your pain through a perspective that God's got a purpose in it. You know, God didn't give me cancer, but I can, you know what? God didn't give you some of the things you've gone through, but we blame God. God gave me an opportunity to make some lemonade. For the gospel. You see, James says it like this. For we know that when your faith is tested. How many of you feel your faith is tested sometimes? He says, your endurance has a chance to grow. 
The way a goldsmith or a silversmith can see if, if the product or what they're trying to do is purify it to come bring it to a pure form, what they do is they heat it up with fire. And the dross, the impurities of that metal come, that, it comes to the top and they skim that off. And I had one, one of my teachers, Leonard Ravenhill, he said, you know, he was at a goldsmith. He said, well, how do you know when it's ready? He said, I'll tell you. And he looked at him and goes, well, is it ready? He goes, no, it's not ready yet. He skimmed some more dross off. And he goes, is it ready? Oh, I got to turn the heat up a little bit. More dross. And the, the goldsmith looked at him and he said, it's ready. He goes, well, how do you know when it's ready? He said, I know it's ready when I can look into it and see a reflection of myself. And that's what God does with us. Sometimes you go, why am I going through this? Because God's perfecting you. Let's, let's do a survey. How many used to have a cussing problem? I did. How many used to have a Marlboro problem? I did. How many used to have a, a bong problem? I did. I had lots of issues. I had lots of problems. I was jacked up. But when I met Jesus, he delivered me from those things. There, was it a process? Some of it was. Some of it he immediately delivered me. I didn't want some of those things anymore. Other things, I had to work them through. Come on. You see, God's goal is not to make you happy, but to make you holy. What does whole mean? What does holy mean? You know what holy means? To make you whole. Your body, soul, and your spirit. When you understand that life is a test, you realize that nothing is, a, is insignificant in your life. Wouldn't it be great if God came to you like he does with the weather bulletins? This is only a test of the emergency broadcasting system. And wouldn't it be great if God came, this is only a test of the eternal broadcasting system. This is only a test. Hell is fixing a breakthrough in your life. All hell's fixing to break loose. Your kids are going to rebel. Your husband's going to go astray. Your grandfather is, I mean, you just... This is only a test. Look at me. Life is a test. You may be going through it. I don't know. It's a test. It's a test. When you understand that life's a test, you recognize it's not insane. You know, you never know what you are. Till you go through something, just like a servant. You never know you're a servant until you're treated like one. Spirit, a spiritual leader in Scripture is a servant. My responsibility is not to have a title because title messes up people sometimes. Titles mess up people. I've seen it too many times. You know, the joy, let me say, in Scripture, a spiritual leader, the joy of a true servant is not power, control, comfort, or position. What gives a servant purpose is service. Being able to serve. You know what your greatest thing you can do is not look for a title or position, but to serve the Lord and the purpose that he's put in your life. Am I in the right church? Because, see, James says it like this. James is like the New Testament book of Proverbs. He says, so let it grow. When your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Jesus plus nothing is everything. I'm not going, when they put me in a casket, there's not a trailer hitch attached to it. When I gave my life to Jesus, all I can do is go to him. And my works will be tested by fire. And whatever he puts in that, the wood, hay, and the stubble, God puts that fire to it and he purifies it. And whatever is out of that, I present to him as a gift of my service while I was here on earth to the king of kings. Whatever God's put in your life to do, do it with excellence. Do it with a whole heart. The, fir- the final thing, the f- third and final thing, I love this one. It's called persistence. We need perspective, we need purpose, but you need persistence. We want things now, don't we? And 
We don't like to wait, do we? My wife told me when I was preaching this message in Jenny, she goes, that's you. Out loud, I go, shh. Don't tell my sin. Let me give you an example. How about have you ever seen anybody at the Walmart line and they bring their children and they have all those goodies there and their children manifest the devil? <laughs> I want it. I need it. I'm God, please. Some have even stolen them. You see, kids manifest. God doesn't build you your life in seven minutes. He builds your life over a lifetime. You see, persistence is greater than genius. I'm not that smart, but I'm persistent like a bulldog. You just don't quit. The Bible says if you fall, you rise again. Come on. Just rise up. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for my attitude. Forgive me for my sin. And then you go on. You're free. You're clean. Are you hearing me? That's what Jesus does. He washes us with his blood. We can cry out to him. How many of you know that we're not perfect here? This was a perfect church until you showed up. So look around. I just believe this. You can be the hand of God. I can be the hand of God in the glove of Bubba. You can be the hand of God in your glove and who you are. You can be the me- I believe this. God never sends a messenger from him with an empty envelope. There's been many times when I've talked to people and they'll come, hey, Pastor Bubba, you remember that time? I go, no, nah, I don't remember that time. There's been too many times. But you came and you said or you did or you prayed for me. I had one of the guys in the church in Jennings. He said, I remember you were coming back from a duck hunt. How I met you. He's in the church now. And he goes, you, were, you and your son were in camo. Y'all went to Waffle House. Because the only reason I go to Waffle House, that's Luke's favorite restaurant to eat at. And Waffle House is a small fortune. Okay, it is. I'm like, Dad, gum, man. They love their waffles. They don't even make blueberry waffles. I don't want to come here anymore. Anyway. So we're going to do it. And this guy goes, hey, how'd y'all do? And I told him how we did. And he started telling me he had some church hurt and all this stuff. He wasn't going to church. He knew who I was. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know he knew who I was. He starts telling me all this stuff. And so right there, I just, I just put my hands on him and I prayed for him. God, you know what he's gone, what Chris has gone through. You know what he's faced. You know what, you're the only one that can touch him. And I'm praying out loud in Waffle House, standing up. It wasn't like, Lord, please touch him. Lord, touch him. I mean, I, I don't hear good, so it don't matter. <laughs> and after I prayed for him, he says, do you remember that PB? That's what he called Pastor Bob Sorry. I go, I kind of do. He said, I remember it because it was significant in my life that you listened to me and you prayed out loud at Waffle House for me. That's why I came to check out the church and now he serves and ministers in the church. Listen, just because you start out some way doesn't mean that's what you end up. You see, you endure, you persevere, you weather the storm, you make it through, you don't give up. Hello. There's a guy in this church, Phil McDaniel. His wife said, every time I've told a story about him, you're out of town. And Luke and I and Phil, I have a lot of funny stories with Phil, but Luke and I and Phil went out goose hunting one morning. And man, it stormed. Like when I say stormed, it stormed. I had a rain jacket. I made sure Luke had one. Phil didn't forgot his. So he used a decoy bag. And I told Luke, I said, son, if we can endure the storm, I believe there's going to be ducks and geese on the other side of the storm. It always is. And no sooner had the storm stopped, geese and ducks started coming. And we had a great hunt. We just did. We weathered the storm. Lightning, thunder, 
You know, you go, why would you do that? I didn't hold my gun. That's a lightning rod. You know, just put it down. <laughs> but we endured it. And because we endured it, we received the harvest. It was ducks and geese. That's important to us when we're out there. That's the purpose we went out there to go get. And see, if you're weathered the storm of what God's given you a picture that you're going to receive, there's a blessing on the other side. How many believe that? You see, life is like, it is like that. Something greater on the other side of the storm. I've had people tell me, I've tried Jesus, but it just don't work. How many of you have people tell you that? I've had people say that. I, I, and I look at them, you might have tried church. You might have tried Sunday. You might have tried a denomination, but you didn't try Jesus. See, that's impossible to say. You tried Jesus and it didn't work. Why? Because look at Romans 10, 11, one of my favorite scriptures. It says, listen what it says. Everyone who believes in him will never be. What does it say? Never be what? Disappointed. Can you name one true follower who's been on their deathbed and ever tell you Jesus is a liar and I regret, he's a liar and I regret ever following him with all my life? I've never had that. I've been people, would be, would be people that I love and I've held their hand. I'm right there at their deathbed. I used to have one guy, his name was Craig Broussard. He used to live in Gaydon. And Craig was, when we were starting the church, he was like one of the coolest guys you'd ever know. He had brain cancer. He had three tumors taken out of his brain. And it left him partially paralyzed. And so he'd walk like this when he'd go. And he, his speech had been changed. And I said, hey, Craig. And he'd go, and he'd, get, he'd go like this with his bad hand and shake my hand. We worship. Sometimes you'd hear him go, be the Lord, right in the middle of worship. Be, be, be the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And he's crying. And I remember being in his deathbed. He went to be with Jesus. I did his funeral. He went to be with Jesus. Well, I'm saying that, he didn't regret what he went through. He didn't tell me, God gave me them doggone tumors. And your brother. God used his life to preach louder than words could ever preach to people. By the way, he chose to live. Because you know what Craig had? Craig had, he had a different perspective. God giving him a purpose. He still tried to work. He still tried to do things. But you know what? He was persistent. He'd get up. Philippians says it like this. Let me just wrap this up. So that, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isaiah says it like this in the New Old Testament. It says, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. Isaiah 45, 23. Can I just say this? Jesus is the hero of the story. He's the hero. In your biggest mess, in your life, when things were falling apart, God didn't come to us. We didn't call out to God when everything was going great, did we? We cried out to God when our lives were falling apart that we've given our best and we see the results of our best it's not good God never intended you to walk alone in this life it says through weakness through our weakness that he can be strong how many of you are weak how many need strength well it's here today it's here for the asking he said, you have not because you didn't ask. Hello. Kind of, the gospel's kind of simple. I had a guy yesterday, we were taking down a fence because we bought some more land at Jennings. And I believe great things are fixing to happen around this place. Amen. 
And I was just unscrewing screws from a fence with another guy. And a guy, his name's Derek Miller. He's a, he's a deputy, but he's kind of got some authorities, one of the patrol supervisors. And God's revolutionized his life. He said, man, Pastor Bob, I, my supervisor just found out he's been really sick. And this, this guy's helped me with my guns, put my scopes inside of man. So I'm like, what's going on with him? Pastor Bubba, he had to give up some responsibility and give it to me, and I'm having to work extra. And he said, but I'm just really concerned for him. And he said, he's a great guy. He said, it's real intimidating to talk to him. I go, why? He goes, because he has a theology degree, too. I go, so what? You know what you have? You have a, you have you graduated from Bush University. He looks at me. I did? I'll go, yeah, the burning bush. You've had an experience with God. I don't care what someone got in their head. You have an experience right here. And he goes, yeah, he has a theology degree, but he's living with his girlfriend. I go, well, that's bad theology right there. You need to just love him ministry and I said tell him I'll, I'll talk to him tell me come meet me if you want some hope Jesus the hero how do you remain passionate with God keep your passion guard it anything you know that the world's a robber the devil's a robber he's a thief what is he trying to take from you your joy your joy he said the joy of the Lord is your strength come on the first year I had cancer, God gave me that word. Here's your word for the year. I didn't know what I was going to go through. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Every time I'm tempted to follow a celebrity or to get their advice, I think of Philippians 2. Every knee will bow. I believe that this Jesus, the hero in this story, came to raise the dead. How many of God still raising dead people today? How many believe that? Look around the crowd. All of you were dead and he raised you up. You see, I believe that. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be wise. You don't have to be wonderful. You just have to be dead. That's all. What do you mean, Pastor Baba? That you die to yourself. You take up the cross of Jesus and you follow him wherever he has you to go. See, in church today, what I've learned when I look at other people don't want to talk about, say the name sin even. That's a bad word. No? I think people run from it because they might be filled with it. But sometimes we've got to deal with ourselves. Hello? How many of you like you know the most stubborn person you deal with is yourself. It's kind of like the bayou. The loneliest bayou is by yourself. You're the hardest person to deal with. Because, because see, we judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. You'll get that later. It just kind of... It's like the dove flew over your head. God loves you enough that he sent his son. Like Esther said, she can't give up gray. I have five sons. I'm like, I couldn't pick. There's some days I could. <laughs> to be honest with you, take him. <laughs> you know? And you have multiple children. You know what I'm talking about. I brought you in this world. I can take you out too. Anyway, no hints. That's not the gospel. That's just feelings. And feelings and emotions are bad leaders. God just wants to lead you, direct you. And sometimes we don't like correction because we think it's rejection. Correction, it just brings direction. Hello. I've learned this. I told my wife the other day, we kind of got in a little fight. We don't have like firework fights, but we kind of got a disagreement. And I just looked at her and said, you win. You win. In other words, I'm not arguing with you no more. You win. Because, see, sometimes we argue because we want to win. Boy, it got real quiet in the house. 
We want to win. But when you give up, you go, you can have, I, you won. And that's how we have to be with God. God, you win. I give up. Let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, thank you for everyone here today. Thank you for the people that are here in this Crowley Church. What a wonderful group of people. Not because they just come here, but they, they're people that are hungry. They love you. Thank you that they're being led by JJ and Esther. Many of the leaders here that are just wonderful people. I pray that you would pour your spirit upon people, even right now. Let me just say, this isn't a, somewhat of a, it can be a, anything can be a salvation message. But just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. This is a message of encouragement. We're encouraging you. Some of you have been walking through some really hard stuff. You needed to hear this. Some of you have faced a lot of lies. And you need God's strength right now. If that's you, just stand to your feet. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to plead. Because God's going to strengthen you as you stand this morning. Not being fearful of what people think around you. That you know that you need the power of God when you walk out of this place this morning. That you're not, you said, I'm not going to be set in my ways. I'm not going to, you know, put concrete in the fence posts and set right here. I'm going to let God soften my heart. I'm going to let God have his way and say, God, you win. You win. You win over all my circumstances. Help me to see from your perspective that I have Jesus contact lenses, that my heart beat. So, that God, you would give me a new Jesus pacemaker, that my heart beat would beat with your very heart. That I have a vision for people that are so lost that need you. And I couldn't pass them by. That you stand up right now. I'm not going to ask again. I'm just going to say there's many people standing. But I believe there's more that need to stand. Listen, I can just say every time someone says you need the power of God, the strength of God, I'm standing up. Because I need that every day of my life. If you think I'm just preaching to the crowd, there's more fingers pointing back at me than me pointing at you. If that's you, just stand. As you're standing, just everybody, just lift your hands to the Lord. Just both hands. I'm going to pray over you right now. Father, you see these hands. These hands mean I surrender. I need all of you. And so, Father, thank you. Thank you for every one of these precious, incredible people. That God, that sometimes we're so blinded by things we walk through and lives that we pass by, things that we say or things that we do. But yet, God, sometimes we need to take that moment and say, God, I need a fresh touch. I need a fresh outpouring of your spirit. God, just come, even right now, Holy Spirit, refresh, renew. Burn off all the impurities that are maybe we've attached to, what we've trusted in. And God purifies that we would just be a reflection of you to the rest of the world. When people that would see us, they would see Jesus. So Father, touch everyone. Fill them fresh and fill them new. Pour cur- download courage into their hearts and their spirits. God, make them whole, body, soul, and spirit. Whatever they've walked through, whatever they face. I pray that you would come and bring your strength, your forgiveness, and your power. I pray that this morning on everyone here in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you believe that, say, I agree.